Welcome to this lecture, which is on the early 19th century and looking at what's going on in, this, in the American culture and how that's affecting and influencing literature, in particular between 1800 and 1865. So one of the things we have to see within the early 19th century is there's a lot of shifting paradigms. Right By the time we get to the early 1800s, the, Amer the United States has formed itself as a nation, has been able to survive for a generation, right? We're starting to see some of the war, you know, we start seeing the people of, that, that fought in the American Revolution, uh, that were the founding fathers, they're slowly dying off in the 18, early 1800s, and we're seeing the first, you know, we're starting to see the, genera the, the new generations, the generations after the war, uh, and they're, they're trying to reconcile what, what are we? Um, and there's different things that are going on that, that impact this. So one of the big things is the abolition movement, right? And the abolition movement is in some ways an extension of the American Revolution. It is this new approach or new look at just what are, you know, what do we mean when we say inalienable rights? Who does that include, right? The Constitution really played around with this. They, they created the three-fifths law, which said all slaves were only considered three-fifths of a person as it, uh, as it relates to the count of the population with regards to voting, but they themselves had no rights, essentially. And we all, but there's another clause within the amendment, uh, I'm sorry, within the Constitution that also said, you know, that also identifies that the slave trade will end, or that is you can no longer have an active slave trade. So this is, the abolition movement is an extension of what we see go on in the revolution, and it's a push to, of course, end slavery. And that idea will continue to, you know, build tension within the culture and have very many different viewpoints and, and a lot of different verbal clashings before we see actual clashing uh, in the Civil War. We see religious responses, uh, the rise of the Second Great Awakening, and the, you know, the Second Great Awakening is this extension of, of the, the, great, the First Great Awakening in the 1700s with people like Jonathan, Jonathan Edwards and, and George Whitfield, where you know, there's this attempt to revive people's emotional and spiritual connection to God. Uh, and in some ways, you can look at the Second Great Awakening as a response to the Enlightenment and in the Americas an attempt to bring people back to Christianity. And it's not that people don't believe in Christianity, but they are not necessarily as, as confined to Christianity as they had been in previous centuries. And it continually gets harder to keep a population religious because there's increasingly much more diversity. There's, there's so many things going on that raise questions about Christianity, that it can be hard to keep cultural focus on that. And with that is also the rise of individualism in the American identity, right? As early as the, in the early 1800s, we have this person named Alexis de Tocqueville. And he goes on this, tour, he's a Frenchman who goes on this tour of the Americas and he writes this very famous book called Democracy in America. And in a lot of ways, he very, very keenly tunes into the American identity and this idea of individualism and the, the, the sense that despite being derived of Europe, there is something unique about Americans or there is increasingly something unique about Americans from their you know, individualism to their attempt to, you know, from the, their, dis their desire to continually be productive. There are these things going on. We, see, we certainly see this idea present in our culture today. Um, individualism is, of course, the cornerstone of all marketing, right? You look at any marketing campaign, you look at anything that's advertised, and so much of it is based around you as the individual and what, you, you know, what is freeing to you, whether it's a sports car, whether it's lipstick, whether it is a, a, a particular can of soda, right? It is all around this idea of you, the individual, being empowered. And of course, that's a, a major, I mean, that, that's almost in our blood, one could say. And we also see American expansionism. And this is an important thing. It's challenging for some people to hear and to understand, but America from very early, the United States from very early on is an expansionist country. 
it will, you know, the development of the Monroe Doctrine, which basically says to Europe, anything that goes on in the Western Hemisphere, that is with North America or South America, the United States, the United States is the sole person to get involved. So basically said, Europe, you can no longer invade or try to do anything in the politics of the Americas. That's solely for the United States to do. It's a very, very egocentric view saying, oh, no, 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 we get to decide what's going on here in the Americas. Not just the United States, but all of the Americas. We have Manifest Destiny, which is advocated throughout the 1800s of this idea of we need to go west, we need to conquer that area, we need to own that area, we need to run from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And this idea of the Wild West and calling it the Wild West, it was not the Wild West. What it was is it was a place where Native Americans lived. But if we called it wild and we talk about ourselves as civilized, then that gives us the civilized, you know, the civilizing mission. We need to go and tame the Wild West. We need to lay bare to it. And we really do see throughout the eight, you know, throughout the 1800s continually the United States provoking other countries either into war, such as happens in the Mexican-American War, as well as the Spanish-American War. Uh, and also just laying claim to you know to resources you know the United States buys the Louisiana Purchase but the Louisiana Purchase was filled with Native Americans who by all rights would seem to be the people that owned it but the but the United States buys Louisiana Purchase from the French and so there isn't you know the, there is the sense of very questionable dealings in a desire for the United States to get bigger and to be a larger, more powerful country. What else do we see here? We see changing technology, right? We see cheaper paper, and of course, with cheaper paper will come increased literacy, right? There's a new, they, they discover a new method of making paper that makes it even, you know, easier to print, and the paper quality isn't necessarily all that great, but it does allow for more things to be printed. We see the rise of railroads, and the railroads are a very, very important thing because the railroads make the United States smaller. And what I mean by this is when you have a railroad, you now can get not just people, but large amounts of resources thousands of miles away. Right? And this is what drives, of course, the Civil War. But you can take lots and lots of coal, you can take lots and lots of food, you can take lots and lots of anything, put it onto a train and have it somewhere else in two or three days. Right? Not two or three weeks, not two or three months, but two or three days. That revolutionizes how we imagine the world. It makes the Americas smaller. It makes the United States smaller so that they can do more. And they certainly do with that. We see the rise of the telegraph, which you know is essentially, for them, modern day, you know, it, it was text messaging. It was instant communication with part, all different parts of the world. And that again changes how people, you know, what makes the world smaller. If you can communicate 3,000 miles away that something is happening, you can react better. You can get more things onto those railroads to go react to whatever that is. That might be soldiers, that might be food, that might be supplies. So all these technologies are changing how people communicate, how they interact, how they understand the world, and how they understand their role in the world. And with all of that comes industrialization and urbanization. We see massive, you know, this is, this is the age of the, of the industry. This is the age in which we see the rise of work mills. Uh, for people in the New England area, people may be familiar with the Lowell work mills, where you would have hundreds of people in a factory, right? You see the rise of these factories with hundreds or thousands of people working in a factory, producing things. And in order to run, factories. You need urbanization. You need to take a city and develop it in ways in which you can fit lots and lots of people into small little places that we call apartments. Of course, what we call apartments today in a developed country is lavish compared to the apartments that you're seeing in the 1800s or in less developed parts of the world today. I mean, an apartment could be could have five people, six, seven people living in it and I, you know, not five or six bedrooms, but a one-room apartment, five, six, seven people living in it. 
Um, they were not, they, you know, many of them were not lush in any way. But you see extreme concentration of people, extreme concentration of factories and workers and you know people leaving farms in rural areas or into more urban areas and of course living in urban areas changes how we relate changes how we talk if you lived in a rural area you might not meet a a potential sexual interest partner for a very long time and only under strict conditions if you live in an urban area you're going to find a lot more potential sexual and romantic partners all around. We also see the rise of an educated citizenry, right? By the 1830s or so, we see the, implement, the, the implementation of universal education, or at least access to universal education up to, I believe it was the sixth grade, or up to the fifth grade, right? So we start to actually create Educate, we, we start to allow for the opportunity for many more people to become literate. And that, you know, we as a country said, this is a good idea to have an educated citizenry, and so we need to support that. We see also the rise of collegiate institutes. So we're familiar with, of course, the Ivy Leagues, right? Your Harvard and your Yale, your Williams and Mary. These are all kind of, these are all colleges that have been around since the 16 and 1700s. But we see a huge outpouring of many, many more colleges in the 1800s. Many of the colleges that are around today started in the 1800s. And then, of course, we see that 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 rise of a pot, you know, that rising population growth. You know, a good example is, of course, New York City, which in 1800 had a population of 500,000, and in 1900 had a population of four million. Right. So, city populations in population as a whole continues to explode, and that's a largely po literate population. And so, there's going to be a very strong hunger for literature. Right? We're going to see a lot more readers come out of this time. And so with that, we get this literary explosion. We see an increase in genres and voices and styles. Right? So we see different types of publications pop up. We see newspapers, dime novels, magazines, pamphlets. We see the rise of different genres in writing styles, so the rise of romanticism and naturalism. There's American Gothic and, transcendental, and transcendentalism. Uh, we see, all, you know, we see the rise of mystery during this time as well, and we see distinct and influential poetry. That is poetry that is American in nature and ha becomes established and, and seen in the larger world as. American poetry that is important for other people to read. So the French are all over Edgar Allan Poe's poetry, but Emerson and Dickinson, Dickinson also become highly popular at this time and are seen as distinctly American poets. We see the rise of many other voice voices in the American canon. They aren't necessarily recognized at the time. Many female African American and other minority writers of this time do write and do publish, but they're not really valued or recognized until the 1900s, uh, until people look back and realize, wow, there, not only were there female writers, but they were writing about important stuff. Wow, there are African American writers who were, that, who were writing for an audience um, that was largely other African Americans and had that audience. That is to say, you know, the perception of what African Americans were versus the reality that many of them were literate. You know, many of them were engaged in these debates around identity. And we start to see the rise of literal, literary and intellectual contributions from America. Um, and with that, we see this moving beyond Europe. That is, America becomes, start, the United States starts to really look within its literature to identify and define itself as something other than Europe. And so there's that eternal question of what is American about this writing. So all of these kind of things come together and really do change. And this is, you know, it's interesting that American Literature One ends on this note because this, you know, the, this is where American literature really starts to take off, is as it finds its own voice, as it's moved beyond Europe, as it's established its own, um, you know, its own large publication, range of publications, its, its new genres and all of those things. All right, thank you for listening, and see you on the next video.